Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, as we open up your word tonight, Lord, we ask for your presence, Father. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come into this room tonight and order all things that are said, done, and thought, Lord, Father God, for everything that we do, Lord, is for your glory, Lord. And we are so glad that you gave us your word to guide our lives. So, Father, that is our prayer tonight. I say a special prayer for Pastor Don and Lynn, Lord, for the physical healing that they, that you will provide for them, Lord, Father God, and for all the people who are sick in the body, Lord, that you give them a special touch and a physical healing, Lord, because with you all things are possible. So, Lord, as we dedicate this night to you, Lord, please visit us. Again, Holy Spirit, we invite you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless. Well, good evening. If you don't have a Bible, make sure you get a Bible. Um, John is going to get you one. Make sure you have one. Be equipped. Be ready to go. Well, praise the Lord. We're going to get in the Word and um, the Holy Spirit University, right? That's where we're going. We're going to let the Holy Spirit teach us. Amen. So let's go ahead and pray. And uh, Father, we come before you again, and we, uh, we lift this evening before you. We, we pray, uh, Jesus, you're everything, and we thank you for who you are. We love you. We praise you because you are worthy. And Lord, we pray, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church. We pray, Lord, that we are celebrating Christmas, and we are exchanging gifts, and we are having our families, but may we never forget our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted for the faith in North Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, China, and many parts of the world. And so we lift our brothers and sisters before you. May we never forget. We just pray that you touch them this evening and you be with them. We love you and praise you, and we pray that you uh, enter in and teach us we love your word, we love you, and help us to love you and love people. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. So, yeah, we are going to be in um, uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 12. And, you know, you know, you look at this chapter, and I'll tell you, there's a, there is a lot to be said in this chapter. Uh, I'm amazed every time I read the word, it, just the applications and uh, it, it, it applied back then, but it applies us to us today. And we have the reign of Joash. And we see that he is, that Jehoiadai, he is the high priest who is engineering it. And this is the beginning of a great spiritual movement that you call revival. And you know, I, I think of uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, Seek my face and pray, and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. God will forgive us of our sins, and he will heal our land. That's a message in any generation, any time. It's a message for tonight and beyond. You know, there was two great revivals, and um, the Great Awakening in the 1700s, 1734, and Jonathan Edwards, pastor, and revival broke out in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, and broke out in Philadelphia in over 100 towns. In order for revival to take place, you have to have repentance. You know, you have to repent with a repentant heart. You have to love the Word of God. You've got to love Jesus Christ. If you do those things, great things are going to happen. The Great Awakening. A second Great Awakening was in the 1800s through 1840. It went on for quite a long time, and it was in Logan, Kentucky, as far away as uh, Ohio, and thousands got saved upon many. And, you know, praise the Lord. God is in the work of changing lives, and, you know, from the, from the ash heap to my feet are on the solid rock. On Christ the rock I stand, amen. All other ground is sinking sand, amen. You know, just to get a reboot and a refresh, you know, you have... You have the northern kingdom, right? 
you have 19 kings, and they're all bad. Every one of them. Pretty wicked men. Um, you know, when you take God out of the equation and you're led by the flesh, you could do some horrible, wicked things. And uh, so you had 19 kings uh, in, in north. They were all bad. 20 kings in the south, and there were about seven or eight that were good, give or take. And um, so let's get into it. Let's get into this, this chapter. Let's read verses 1 through 3, if we would. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash became king. He reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Bathsheba. Joash did what right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoadai the priest instructed him. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. You know, Joash, he did, you know, he, uh, did well when Jehoadai the priest was was around when he was alive. He kind of mentored him. He kind of was his spiritual advisor, his counselor. And um, Jehoahash reigned for 40 years. And this was a long reign. Mostly it was blessed. But after Jehoi, Jehoi, uh, after Jehoash for, fell short, he fell short of commitment and the complete of godliness. He fell short. And we're going to see how he was really kind of strong. But then when that mentorship was taken and was not there, he fell. You know, I, I think of this, you know, when you walk with the wise, you'll be wise. And when you walk with the fool, you'll be a fool. I think it's so important to surround your people, to surround yourself with people that are, that love God. Because it's contagious, it kind of trickles down, it's very contagious. And um, very, very important. And you know, the thing is, this is a race, and I've said this many times, you know, I want to start strong, I want to finish strong. I want to start in the spirit and I want to finish in the spirit, right? I don't want to start in the spirit and finish in the flesh. And that's going to be a theme for tonight. So just hold that thought. Amen. Let's read verse 2 again, if we would. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiadai the priest instructed him. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 24, and that's going to be a chapter we're going to spend some time in. 2 Chronicles 24. Um, just a few. Let's go forward on that. 2 Chronicles 24. And we're going to read verses 15 through 23, if we would. <clears throat> and here's what it says. It says, But Jehoiadai grew old, was full of days, and he died. He was 130 years old when he died, so he lived a long life. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. Now after the death of Jehoiadai, the leaders of Judah came, bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. Verse 18. Therefore they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespasses. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. They testified against him, but they would not listen. Isn't it amazing how God sends his people to bring people back into repentance, into a right relationship with him because of his great love? God's long-suffering, and God's very personal. But, you know, notice they would not listen. They didn't heed the instructions, and that's to their demise. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiadai, the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord? So you cannot prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. Yeah, there's a sowing and reaping, isn't there? So they conspired against him. At the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. You know, when I was thinking of this, reading this, I, I saw a parallel between Stephen. They stoned Stephen, right? Stephen was giving uh, Israel, he was giving a concise history lesson on Israel of the Old Testament. And then Stephen said, basically, you've missed the Messiah, 
you crucified the Messiah. And they didn't like it. They gritted their teeth, uh, the Jewish leaders, and, and you know, uh, he said, you know, they had stony hearts, and, and they stoned Stephen. And sometimes, you know, when you're a messenger of God, uh, you know, it, it, people are going to get angry. But you know what? They were faithful. And I, like I said, we want to start in the Spirit, and we want to finish in the Spirit. Stephen did that. Zechariah did that. Parallel. <clears throat> Let's continue on. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiadai, the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord? So you cannot prosper because you have forsaken the Lord. He has forsaken you. So they conspired against him. At the command of the king, they stoned him with stones. I say it again, at the house of the Lord. Thus, Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiadai, his father, had done to him, but killed his son, and he died. He said, the Lord look on and repay it. So it happened in the spring of the year that the army of Syria came up against him, and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the leaders of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil to the king of Damascus. Now let's go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 12. 2 Kings chapter 12 and let's read verse 3 again. And keep your marker in that, in that place. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places, on the high places. The high places were not taken down. Joash had a halfway reformation, not a total reformation, of Israel's worship. He took on, he did not take on the more difficult job of removing the high places. And many times, many were still sacrificing of offering incense in the high places. Even among the priests, there were those who were not revived. Let's take it down to verse 4 and 5 and read this. I'm breaking it down. And Jehoash said to the priest, All the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man senses money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring in the house of the Lord, into the house of the Lord. Let the priests take it to themselves, each from his consistency, constituency, there you go, <laughs> and let him repair the damages of the temple wherever any dilapidation is found. So Jehoash, to the priest, said to the priest, as the final, as the final stages of renewal and the covenant with Jehovah God, it was necessary to repair those sections of the temple that had fallen into a state of dilapidation, a state of dilapidation. And you know, Ataya, you know, she was wicked, wasn't she? You know, Brother Mike has said it was uh, Jezebel 2.0, wasn't it? You know, uh, yeah, like, like mother, like daughter. And you know, she basically massacred the members of the royal house of Judah, except Joash. Remember Joash, he was spared. He was hidden in the, in the temple, kind of like a nursery there for seven years, right? And, uh, and he was hidden away. Now let's go back, let's go back to uh, 2 Chronicles 24, because we're going to revisit that chapter quite a bit. And uh, let's tie this, this chapter into it. So 2 Chronicles 24. <clears throat> and let's take it verse 6 and 7, if we would. 24, 6, and 7. So the king called Jehoiadai, the chief priest, and said to him, Why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and from Jerusalem the collection according to the commandments of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the assembly of Israel, for the tabernacle of witnesses? For the sons of Atalia, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God, and had also presented all the dedicated things of the house to the Lord, to the Baals. So, you know, she didn't have a heart for the Lord, did she? She was really a wicked, uh, evil 
and she wanted to reign. She wanted to slaughter everyone that got in her way. And uh, we know the story, you know, you, God had taken care of her, took her out, didn't he? You know, sometimes you think you get away with something, but you never really get away with anything. Because, you know, God is a just God, and he will get justice, and justice is going to prevail. But the temple needed repair because it had been damaged by the previous evil leaders, especially Natalia. The temple was to be a holy place. Now let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 12, if we would. 2 Kings chapter 12. The temple was to be a holy place, set apart to worship God. And you know, when I was thinking about that, as the temple was set apart to be a holy place to worship God, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, aren't we? And we want to worship God in spirit and truth, don't we? And you know, I was thinking of Psalm 91. You know, there's 16 verses in that. I've, I've said Psalm 91 many times, and man, I'll tell you, it's, it's beautiful. But the first few verses, it says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. You know, the secret place of the Most High. You know, we just got to get into the secret place of the Most High in life. The busyness of life, the trials, the tribulations, the noise, the irritants, the distractions come our way, don't they? And sometimes we just got to get into that sanctuary, that holy place of the Most High, and seek God and worship God in spirit and truth. Very important. Very important. Now, thanks to Joash's fund, as we continue reading, thanks to Joash's fund, the racing program, it, it could be restored. It had to be restored. The dirt, the filth, had collected inside the temple over the years, and uh, they cleaned out the joints, they re-mortared, uh, they put mortar in the joints, and the heathen idols and the other traces of idol worship were removed, and the gold and the bronze was polished. And the neglected condition of the temple reveals just how far people strayed from God. And you know, that's to me, that's a, that's a moment strayed from God. That's a phrase that I want to latch on to tonight because we can stray from God, can't we? It's very easy, you know? I mean, you've seen people uh, on a person, you know, you, you've run across people and you know people personally. Maybe it's yourself. You've gone to church, you've been faithful going to church, and then what happens? And sometimes you, then you start to drift away. You know, as you were going every Sunday, then it, it was not, you missed another Sunday, you missed a Sunday, and then you came back for two weeks, you missed a Sunday, and you were very inconsistent, and what happens? Then you start drifting, and then you're not in church. It's very easy to do. You know, Satan wants you to drift away from God. And I tell you what, it's subtle. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's subtle. It's kind of like you're out in the ocean, you know, and you, you get caught up in a riptide. And next thing you know, you know, you're, you're getting further and further away from the shoreline, right? And the people are getting smaller and smaller. And I think that's how Satan works. He gets us in an undercurrent, and he gets us to drift he wants us to drift away from the things of God. And like I say, we got to get in the secret place of the Most High. we got to be in fellowship. It's so important because, you know, when we come here tonight, we experience God's power, God's presence, and God's people. And I'll tell you what, we are living epistles read of all men, aren't we? And we need to be around each other. You know, I come in here, I sit down, I talk to somebody, and and I get blessed, and they strengthen me, and hopefully I strengthen them. And it's, it's really a, a beautiful trade-off, you know. And if we get away from the things of God, our heart becomes drifting. And calluses start being become cold. And so we know things are happening so fast right now as far as the prophetic timetable. We see things are closing. The window of opportunity for salvation is closing. God's going to wrap this up. But, you know, in the meantime, we occupy till he comes, right? Let's not get caught up in things that are, cause us to drift. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? Very, very important. Amen. 
You know, we continue to read this, and, uh, you know, the heathen idols, you know, they, 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 had to, they strayed from God, and, and uh, you know, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourself together, right? So I'm coupling that in, encouraging. I, I meet people that have been in church, and just to kind of come back onto this thing, um, they've been hurt. They, things have happened. And, you know, they, then they're away from church, you know, and, and, and like I say, everybody's got a storyline, right? But I tell you what, you know, Jesus is always the, the, Jesus is always the one that we look to. He is, he is the example, right? Jesus is always faithful when we're faithless. Jesus is faithful. Amen. Let's take it to verse 6. Now it was so by the 23rd year of King Joash that the priests had not repaired the damages of the temple. That's a long time, 23 years. You've seen this. And you look at verse 6, and instructions were not followed, possibly because the, because the total temple income was insufficient to support the Levites. Okay? Previous idolatry under Atalia had discouraged giving by the people. So this woman really influenced a lot of people to not serve Jehovah God. Don't give to the God. Don't waste your money. And so, you know, she was a bad seed, wasn't she? And uh, let's continue to read on. So King Joash called Jehoadai, the priest, and the other priest, and said to them, Why have you not repaired the damages of the temple? Now therefore, do not take more money from your constituencies, but deliver it for repairing the damages of the temple. So do not take more money from your constituencies. Jehoash commanded that they cease receiving these monies from the worshipers. So really, they, they took a different strategy. They would uh, receive it in a different way. And the priests agreed that they would neither receive more money from the people nor repair the damages of the temple. Then Jehoiadai, the priest, took a chest, bored a hole in its lid, set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who kept the door put there all the money brought into the house of the Lord. So they put this chest so that people could give for the Lord. The priest agreed. For practical reasons, new arrangements were advised, recommended to collect money, repair money, in which the process, the priests were eliminated. They consented in a different way, a different way. When the priest failed to do the work that we saw in verses 6 and 7, because they were kind of called on the carpet, the king took personal hand in seeing to the accomplishment. The chest was to be set against the, the, wa the wall at the entrance, facing the right side of the altar. And the people responded generously. And you know, I think what's really special is that when we respond and when we give money to the Lord, let's do it with a cheerful heart, not a grudging heart. You know, if, it, if you can't give, you know, uh, you know, cheerfully, just don't give. Keep your money. You know, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, you know. You do more good giving uh, to him, than, you know, because there's a, there's a spiritual boomerang, right? So, but they gave generously. And, and the point is, is give because you want to, not out of constraint. You know, some churches, they, they, they cause you, it's a, it's a big money program, and, you know, they, they put guilt upon you, and, you know, no, we don't do that here. You give willingly, you know, and, and uh, out of a cheerful heart, amen. And that's how, that's how it should be done, amen. You know, so they gave generously. Uh, let's go to 2 Chronicles uh, verse 10, if we would. So, boy, we're sure, we're sure going to know that chapter quite a bit, aren't we? 2 Chronicles 24 verse 10. Let's go back to that chapter. And let's look at it again. <clears throat> so, 2 Chronicles 24, and I want to look at verse 10. Let's read it. And here's what it says. Then all the leaders and all the people rejoiced. They brought their contributions and they put them in the chest and all had given they had all given. So the work was proceeding from being 
and soon completed. It was going to be soon to, com to be completed. And we'll see that as we continue reading on this chapter. Uh, let's go to verse 10. Then all the leaders and all the people rejoiced. They brought their contributions and put them into the chest until all had given. And so it was at that time when the chest was brought to the king's official by the hand of the Levites. And when they saw there was much money that the king's scribes and the high priest officer came, emptied the chest and took it and returned it to its place. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. So money was coming in and uh, it must be remembered, that, you know, it's interesting. You know, I, it's interesting when you, when you study the word, there's, there's culture and there's history behind uh, the time frame. And, you know, it must be remembered that no coins existed as yet. The lumps of silver, which passed as shekels, were of uncertain weight. Now, a shekel is about 11 grams. It's a very light weight. It's, it, it translates into about 0.0. Four ounces for a shekel, and uh, that's pretty light. Um, consequently, to know the value of the money in each in each bag, it was necessary not only to count the pieces, but to weigh each one separately. Okay. Verse twelve. The king and Jehoiada gave it to those who did the work of the service of the house of the Lord. They hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also those who worked in iron and bronze to restore the house of the Lord. And so the temple by now had been standing for a little over 150 years, and it was obviously that it needed repairs. You know, Solomon, when he built the temple, he built it with the best of the best. I mean, you know, the Maserati of the Maserati parts. I mean, it was, it, was, it was pretty valuable stuff that he put in, and it was, it was there to last, but, you know, 150 years, and if you neglect it, it's going to start to deteriorate, no matter how good it is, no matter what kind of product you put into it. You know, if I get a car, and I have a car for 10 years, and I drive that thing, and I neglect to change the oil and do the tune-up and change the tires and wash and wax, it's going to start to break down, Right? I got a house, you know, it's great owning a home, you know, it's a blessing, but it comes a lot of responsibility, a lot of maintenance, right? You know, the roof starts to leak, the plumbing starts to leak, uh, the paint starts to chip, the electrical starts to break down, it needs to be maintained, doesn't it? And so it had been neglected, it has been standing for 150 years and it needed repairs. So the workmen labored, and the work was completed by them. They restored the house of God to its original condition and reinforced it. And so at first, no funds for the fashioning of the sacred vessels, but there was money left over at the completion of the building, repairs. And it was, it was with sacred vessels that could be completed as well. Let's, look at, let's go back to 2 Chronicles 24, and let's look at verse 14 if we would, okay? 2 Chronicles 24, verse 14. When they had finished, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada. They made it articles for the house of the Lord, articles for serving and offering spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. So the people had given generously. The money remained after all the work had been done. The extra money was allowed for complete restocking the temple with the gold and the implements, the silver, needed for its service. Needed for its service, the daily burnt offerings were a sign of spiritual vitality and faithfulness to God. As long as Jehoiada remained alive, Judah enjoyed revival of true worship of God, as long as he remained alive. Now let's go back to uh, 2 Kings, verse 12, if we would. 
And let's to continue on with our verses here. 2 Kings chapter 12. Let's take it down to verse 14. And they gave that to the workmen and the repair of the house of the Lord with it. So they used the money solely for the repairs, okay? As we see that in verse 14. Moreover, they did not require an account from the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to workmen, for they dealt faithfully. Now, on this verse 15, the overseers of the project dealt faithfully with the money Joash had commissioned. They were trustworthy men. In other words, they were faithful people that they were used to count the money, and they didn't have to have an accounting. They were very faithful. And no accounting was really necessary. And, and let me just say this, what a contrast. What a contrast between the building superintendents who needed an accounting for the use of the money and the priest who couldn't be trusted to handle their funds well enough to set aside to the temple. As trained men of God, the Levites should have been responsible and concerned. After all, the temple was their life's work. Though the priests were not dishonest, they did not have the commitment or energy needed to finish the work. Sometimes God uses, sometimes God's work is better accomplished by devoted people. And don't let your lack of training or position stop you from contributing to God's kingdom. You know, the thing is, if you're faithful and you're trustworthy, you're honest, your word is your bond, God's going to use you. God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for ordinary people that are faithful, that are trustworthy, you know, and to carry out God's work. You know, I'll tell you this. There's three things in life that really I think is really important that I would tie it into the spiritual kingdom is this. Is your attitude, your desire, and your heart. Three things, three qualities. If you have that spiritually, if your attitude is right before God, God's going to use you. If your desire before God is right, God's going to use you. Okay? Attitude, desire, and your heart. God is going to use you in a, in a big way. God's not a respecter person. You know, some people look around, they say, I could never do that. These are very special people over here, you know, and I, I just can't do that. But you know what? God uses anybody, anybody that's available. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things, doesn't he? You know, here I am, God, send me. I remember David Eckstein uh, for, uh, you know, for baseball fans. I don't know if I'm um, kind of a baseball fan. And, you know, he wasn't that big of a guy. He was about 5'7", five, 5'6". Five, he played 10 years, and uh, he played for the Angels. He played for St. Louis and other teams. But, he, you know, he, he wasn't the fastest. He wasn't the strongest. He worked hard. Um, he wanted to win. He had attitude, desire, and heart, and it was contagious among his teammates. He won two, you know, under that he had two World Series under his belt. He was selected to two All-Star um, uh, uh, All-Star teams. And you know, I look at that attitude. If you have a bad attitude, it's like a flat tire. You're not going to go anywhere. You know what I mean? You're not going to go anywhere. God wants to move you. So God wants to use, we're like a link in a chain, aren't we? You know, I think of a bicycle. <clears throat> if I'm going to get that bicycle to go forward, if I take one link out of that chain, that bicycle is not going to go anywhere, right? It's not. If I have a timing chain in a car and that timing chain breaks, it's not going to go forward. So the thing is, we need everybody to do the things of the work of the kingdom. Everybody is important. You know, God's not a respecter person. You know, I, I think of that scripture in James 1.22. Don't just be a, a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Right? And I'll tell you what, there is so much potential here, sitting here amongst these chairs for such a time as this. And sometimes we just got to step out of the boat, and we got to get on the water, and we got to start walking out the things of God. And you know, I want to be led by and filled by the Spirit to do the things of the Spirit. We need the Spirit of God, don't we? I think it was Isaiah 40, verse 31. 
But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I'll tell you what, every day we need to be filled with the Spirit. Every day we need to pray. You know, I think of this book here, Targeted to Prayer, Mike McIntosh. You know, it's, 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 it's an easy read. But you know, it's basically, do you pray for your country? Do you pray for your state? Do you pray for your country? Do you pray for your city? Do you pray for your neighbors? Do you pray for your family? Do you pray for yourself? You know, um, so that God can move. We need to be people of prayer. I'll tell you what, prayer changes things. It changes us to become more like Him. You know, I, you know, I talked to Johnny today, and he was telling me a story about God put somebody in his heart, he was praying for that person, and talking to that person, and you, you'd be driving a car, and some name comes to you and start praying. You know, you start doing something during the day, and God puts something on your heart of a certain circumstance, you start praying. And I'll tell you what, we need to be people of prayer. And like I said, if you want revival, it starts with repentance. Right? It starts with repentance. And if Jesus prayed, how much more should we pray? God wants to use us. We need to be a praying people. Amen. Let's take it to verse 16. <clears throat> the money from the trespasses, the offerings, the money from the sin offerings, was not brought into the house of the Lord. It belonged to the priest. So in verse 16, the money from the sin, trespass offerings, continued to be given to the priest. So those things were dedicated to the priest. Okay, God provided for the priest. The trespass offerings and the, the sin offerings. Okay? It belonged to the priest. The, the point is made that the, the project <clears throat> succeeded without taking any money away from the priest. The temple was not to be repaired and refurbished at the expense, at the expense they received money for their trespass and sin offerings. So God had a system set up that the priests were going to be taken care of, okay? Uh, and and that, he, that he did, that he did. Let's take it down to 17 and 18 if we would. <clears throat> Haziel, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. Then Haziel set his face to go up to Jerusalem. And Joash, Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the sacred things that his father Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Isaiah, king of Judah, had dedicated, and his own sacred things, and all the gold found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord, in the king's house, and sent them to Haziel, king of Syria. Then he went away from Jerusalem. So, looking at this, these verses, Haziel, he was not a nice guy. Like I said, he was from, you know, he was a wicked person, and he set his face to go up against Jerusalem. At the time, the kingdom of Syria attacked Judah with an inferior army. But God used them as instruments of judgment against the disobedient Joash. King Joash was wounded in battle outside of Jerusalem. And, you know, a lot of bad things happened to Joash when Jehoadai died. You know, he, he basically got into, you know, idol worship. He had the influence of, of Jeho, uh, Jehoadai, the priest, that was a spiritual advisor. But when he died, he went south. But let's, let's look at, let's go back to uh, 2 Chronicles 24, and let's camp on verse 23 and 24. And take it down there. So let's go to the same chapter, 2 Chronicles 24. And I want to read verses 20, 23 through 25. So just follow along here. <clears throat> so it happened in the spring of the year that the army of Assyria came up against him. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the leaders of the people from among the people and sent their spoil to the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men. But the Lord delivered a very great army into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. 
Verse 25, And when they had withdrawn from him, they left him severely wounded. His own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the sons of Joagai, the priest, and killed him on his bed. And so he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. And so, again, the story Jehoash, king of Judah, took the sacred things and sent them to Hazael, the king of Syria, instead of trusting God. Joash traded prior blessings, the sacred treasures of the temple, to protect the capital and kingdom against the attacking Syrians. He was in a difficult place. He was wounded with an attacking and successful army bearing down on Jerusalem. He found it hard to trust God in a difficult place because he had stopped trusting God in easier circumstances long before. So Joash started in the spirit and he ended in the flesh. That's the theme. That is the theme. Let's take it to verse 19. <clears throat> let's go back to Second Chronicles. I mean, let's go back to Second Kings chapter, chapter 12, if we would. And let's read verse 19. Let's read, let's read these remaining verses here. It says this, verse 19, Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the servants arose and formed a conspiracy and killed Joash in the house of Milo, which goes down to Cilia. For Josachar, the son of Shineath, Jehoazbad, the son of Shomer, his servants struck him, so he died. And they buried him with the fathers in the city of David. Then Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. And so Joash was severely wounded in Hazael's invasion. He fell victim shortly afterward to the descent unpopularity that culminated in culminated in his assassination. Because Joash's apostasy and murder of Zechariah, Jeho <clears throat> Jehoahai's son, the king was not laid to rest in the royal tombs. And let's take it to a verse here. Let's, let's go back to <laughs> 2 Chronicles chapter 24. And uh, let's take it again there, 2 Chronicles 24. And I want to read verse 25. 2 Chronicles 24, 25. And when they had withdrawn from him, they left him severely wounded. His own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the sons of Jehoiadai the priest and killed him on his bed. So he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs. You know, what's the takeaway from this chapter? I think there's a lot of takeaway. I think we explained quite a few already. But again, God protected Josiah, King Josiah from the Queen Atalia. Attempt to kill him. Initially, Joash faithfully served God, but his obedience stated only a partial obedience. Over time, it grew into a full-blown full -blown rebellion and idolatry. Joash was only partially obedient because his acts of obedience did not come from his heart. He obeyed some areas and disobeyed in other areas, you know? And the thing is, you can't have a half-hearted obedience. It has to be a full heart. It can't be half-hearted, you know? Um, God wants us to worship him, not with a half-heart, but with a full heart, don't we? The Bible says, if you honor with me lips and your heart's far from me, that's not really a heart of obedience, is it? Because you're not really worshiping God in spirit and truth. You know, I think of Psalm 119, verse 11. Let's go to Psalm 119, verse 11. And, and this is our a closing takeaway here. 
Psalm 119, verse 11. That's a big psalm. There's 176 verses in Psalms. And uh, boy, let's, let's look at that. Psalm 119. And let's look at verse 11. <clears throat> Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. And I'll tell you what, that's something I want to be able to fulfill and walk out in shoe leather, right? Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Spending time in God's word, getting into that sanctuary, in that holy of holies, and seeking God and let God speak to you, and you're worshiping in the spirit and truth. The message we see in 2 Kings 12 reminds us of the importance of integrity. You know, integrity is really important as a believer. You know, when you speak, your word should be your bond. When you say things you're going to do, you should fulfill and do those things you say you're going to do, right? You earn your right to speak. And you know, people are looking at you as far as character. Character does matter. And you know, as you walk your walk out, not only here in church, but the seven days a week, 24 hours, as you walk your walk out, people are looking at you, how you live your life, and how you, can you be a man of God or a woman of God? Do you have integrity? People are looking at you. We want to be steadfast in our commitments to God, don't we? You know, I think of a scripture, it's in 1 uh, uh, Corinthians 15, 58, the very last verse. It says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So it's that steadfastness, isn't it, of walking with God, that steadfast. We want to start in the spirit, and we want to end in the spirit, don't we? Not in the flesh. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12, if we would. Romans chapter 12. This is kind of a short chapter, uh, but it's a very good chapter. Uh, not Romans, but I'm talking about 2 Kings chapter 12. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. <laughs> Make a clarification there, right? All righty. <clears throat> So here's what it says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is a reasonable service. You know, Islam, you know, they are given the sixth pillar of Islam is that it's called the jihad, and they are giving their life, and they're doing it in the name of Allah, and they're blowing up men, women, and children, thinking they're serving God. This says being a living sacrifice. That's what I see here, right? Big difference. And then verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, right? Because the world is trying to do that. The world's trying to indoctrinate you. You know, you see the world, what they're doing, and they're they're remolding and indoctrinating at all ages. And you know what? The enemy is out to really to get us and to shape us into the world. You know, the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death, right? God's way is, God's way is a way of life. And you know, really the mind is really, is really, this is the battlefield right here. The heart and the mind, they're kind of connected, aren't they? And we want to get the, the mind renewed. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, right? And so like I said, this is, we're going to the Holy Spirit University. It's the greatest university you can go to because the Holy Spirit is renewing our mind. And God wants us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. Everybody here, you know, is, is thank God you're here. You invest your time, you've got busy schedules, but you make it time to be here. And it's very time that's very profitably spent. And I'll tell you what, it's a beautiful thing that we can gather here. And like I said, don't drift. Drifting is something that can happen very subtly. It can cause your heart to drift. You know, you looked at, you looked at Joash and his heart drifted, didn't he? You know, when, when Jehoiada the priest died, 
you know, he started drifting because he didn't have that spiritual counseling around him. It says when you walk with the wise, you'll be wise. When you walk with the fool, you'll be a fool. And so surround, your peop- surround yourself with people that love God and have a heart for God. Because, you know, attitude, desire, and heart, three things. You got the right attitude, you got the right desire and the right heart, you're going to be profitable for the things of God and for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close. So, Father, we come before you. We thank you for this chapter. It does have a lot of applications for us. And, Lord, it's, it's so simple that uh, you want obedience. You want obedience. You want us to walk in obedience and truth. I pray, Lord, that every one of us this evening, that we could, as we... Uh, Listen to the words in Psalm 91 that we could go to the secret place of the Most High. That we can just tune out that noise and that distractions and the irritants of life. That we can sit at your feet and allow your spirit to be poured into us so that you can pour your, your truth into us that we can give it to other people. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to walk this daily walk. I pray, Father, that we would be a people of prayer. We pray for revival in this nation, for this country, for this people, and so we pray tonight, and we just ask you, Lord, that you give us a heart of prayer. We love you and praise you for all that you've given us. We are a needy people. We need you daily. We cry out to you, fill us, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. amen.